welcome to Mode of Horror, where I explore the details of real life stories of terror and dread. Today's Mode of Horror is murder, specifically the Chicago Tylenol murders. Wednesday, September 29th, 1982, Elk Grove Village, Illinois, a suburb of what was at the time the second most populous city in the U.S., Chicago. At 6.30 a.m., 12-year-old Mary Kellerman awakes feeling ill. She complained to her parents that she had a sore throat. Her parents decided to keep her home from school and give her a capsule of extra-strength Tylenol to help with her pain. Shortly after, Dennis Kellerman, Mary's father, heard Mary enter the bathroom. He heard the door close. Then, he heard something drop. He called into the bathroom for her a number of times, asking if she was okay, but he received no response. Finally, as Dennis Kellerman recalled, I opened the bathroom door and my little girl was on the floor unconscious. Tragically, Mary Kellerman died before an ambulance was able to get her to the hospital. Doctors initially thought that she may have had a stroke, a rare event for someone of that age, but not completely out of the realm of possibility. Of course, the truth was far more sinister. It wasn't known at the time, but this vibrant young seventh grader, taken well before her time, became the first of seven people who would succumb to the same fate. Being the first victim, nothing seemed terribly suspicious about Mary's death. However, other similar deaths quickly began raising questions. That same day, Adam Janis, a 27-year-old postal worker in Arlington Heights, another suburb of Chicago, was also taking a sick day. He went out to pick up his two young children from preschool, and on the way home, he stopped to purchase some extra strength Tylenol. After getting home with his children and having lunch, he decided to take a few of those Tylenol and lie down. Mere minutes passed before he stumbled into the kitchen and crumbled to the floor. A short time later, doctors confirmed Adam's death to his wife, his parents, and several of his other family members. When they left the hospital, instead of returning to their own homes, the entire family went to Adam's home in Arlington Heights. While there, planning his funeral, Adam's younger brother Stanley Janis asked his wife Teresa to go get him some Tylenol to treat his chronic back pain. Teresa grabbed the bottle of extra strength Tylenol Adam had purchased earlier that day. Stanley and Teresa both took a dose of Tylenol and almost immediately collapsed to the floor simultaneously. Although they did not die immediately, Stanley passed away that evening and Teresa died after being taken off life support two days later. The deaths kept coming. 27-year-old Mary Reiner, the mother of a week-old infant, collapsed after taking Tylenol in her home, leaving behind her husband and four children. Mary McFarland, a 31-year-old single mother, took a Tylenol in the back room of her workplace to treat a headache before falling to the floor in front of her co-workers. 35-year-old flight attendant Paula Prince just returning to Chicago on a flight from Las Vegas, picked up some Tylenol from a Walgreens on her way back to her apartment. She was found dead on the floor with an open bottle of Tylenol on her bathroom counter. Between September 29th and October 1st, seven people died from the same sudden cause. These deaths were written off, being attributed to natural causes but something didn't make sense, especially after the death of three members of the Janus family in rapid succession. 
Investigators began searching for a connection between the deaths. Police and investigators went to Adam Janice's house and found no obvious culprit. Helen Jensen, a nurse practitioner, was asked to be part of the investigation as a public health official for the village of Arlington Heights. She was on scene with police investigators searching the Janice house when she came across a shelf full of over-the-counter medication. On that shelf was the bottle of extra-strength Tylenol. Six pills missing, three dead members of the Janice household. She immediately knew it was the Tylenol causing the deaths. No one believed her early assertions. She believed that no one took her seriously being a nurse and a woman. It may have been the first time it was spoken aloud to investigators, but it was not just then her theory was formed. She began to form an inkling earlier when Adam's grieving wife told her that the last thing Adam did was take Tylenol. She stuck firmly to her position that the Tylenol had something to do with it. Two bottles of Tylenol were brought to the medical examiner's office, one from the Janus home and the other from Kellerman's home in Elk Grove, which happened to be inventoried by paramedics. It was noted that both Tylenol bottles had the same control number. Nicholas Pichos, who was an investigator for the medical examiner's office, inspected the bottles. He dumped them out to inspect them and found they appeared to be normal with one critical exception. There was a notable smell of almonds. To an educated and experienced medical examiner like Pichos, this meant just one thing. The pills contained cyanide. Pichos was not without luck, as up to 60% of the population is reportedly unable to detect this odor. Helen Jensen was right. These people were poisoned by cyanide in the Tylenol. It even explained the rapid deaths they each experienced. Cyanide, specifically in this case potassium cyanide, is a very deadly poison. In toxicology, a poison's lethal dose is measured using the median lethal dose, or LD50. This is the amount of a substance that given all at once, would kill 50% or one half of individuals in a population. It is typically expressed as the amount of a substance, usually measured in milligrams, per kilogram of body weight. The LD50 of potassium cyanide is five milligrams per kilogram of body weight. This means the expected median lethal dose for a 180 pound person would be roughly 400 milligrams of cyanide. However, exposure to as little as 50 to 100 milligrams can be enough to cause death. In fact, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security states that when ingested orally, the lethal dosage for potassium cyanide is between 100 and 200 milligrams. This amount is two and a half to five times less than the amount of acetaminophen, Tylenol's active ingredient, in a single extra strength capsule. Cyanide is a well-known poison that has been used for millennia. In fact, during World War II, potassium cyanide was used in suicide pills, also known as L pills, for American and British spies and government officials who went behind enemy lines. L pills were frequently fashioned into a false tooth so they could be carried in the mouth. If necessary, the person deciding to use the pill would bite down into it to release the cyanide contained within, which would kill them within minutes. The L pill was coated with rubber to protect the glass that contained the poison from accidentally breaking. And if it were accidentally swallowed, it would pass through a person's digestive tract harmlessly. The idea of these L pills was that 
if one of these agents was captured, they could opt for a quick, painless death, rather than being tortured into providing state secrets. As the years have passed since then, however, scientists have learned more about how cyanide works within the body. We now know that, while death from cyanide poisoning may be quick, it is certainly not pleasant. According to Johns Hopkins, cyanide poisons the mitochondrial electron transport chain within the body's cells and renders them unable to derive energy, adenosine triphosphate ATP, from oxygen. Essentially, it prevents your body's cells from using oxygen. Even in an oxygen-rich environment, every cell in your body is immediately starved of oxygen, asphyxiated. A person poisoned by cyanide is completely conscious and aware for the entire two to five minutes it generally takes to die from its effects. A person may be expected to experience headache, confusion, lethargy, seizures, decreased inotropy, which is the ability to contract muscles, bradycardia, which means slowed heart rate, pulmonary edema, acute lung injury, nausea, vomiting, and a cherry red skin color. Survivors of cyanide poisoning may experience Parkinson's disease, ataxia, which means abnormal, uncoordinated movements, optic atrophy, which is the wasting of the optic nerve which carries impulses from the eye to the brain, and other neurologic disorders. Cyanide poisoning is a terrible mode of death. Lab reports regarding the Tylenol came back and confirmed that it was, in fact, cyanide far more than enough to kill the victims. Knowing the cause did little to relieve the concerns. This means there could be far more out there still. It left many questions. How widespread is this? Is it national? Local? How do we go about stopping this? On September 30th, the CEO of the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office spoke to the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of Tylenol, to inform him of the problem and to let him know there was going to be a press conference to divulge the news. Later that same day, Johnson & Johnson announced a recall of Tylenol from the batch that was identified in the murders. A few days later, on October 5th, the recall was expanded to a full nationwide recall of Tylenol. 31 million bottles of Tylenol were recalled, costing the company roughly $100 million. This event would go on to be known as the recall that started them all, and is hailed as the gold standard for corporate citizenship. People had to be warned of this danger. Tylenol was stripped from the shelves. Warnings were put out through the media outlets. A 1-800 number was established for panicked Johnson & Johnson customers to call. This was, of course, a time before the internet and social media, so it was not quite so easy to get information to people quickly and readily as it is now. Throughout the entire Chicago metropolitan area, police rode through the streets with bullhorns, urging people not to take the Tylenol. In some cases, they would even go door to door, asking people to give up their Tylenol to ensure it would go unused. This entire process, from the police warnings in the street to the enormous recall of the product, was completely unprecedented. For days, hospitals were crowded with concerned people and poison control lines were flooded with people who felt that they may have unintentionally poisoned themselves with the over-the-counter medication. It was eventually determined that the issue was only local, but drastic measures had to be taken to ensure public health and safety. This became clear when investigations determined that the tainted bottles were manufactured in 
completely different pharmaceutical facilities. The bottles of Tylenol must have been taken from the shelves of retail stores, tampered with, then returned to the store shelves to be purchased by unsuspecting buyers. Now, it was a matter of figuring out who would do such a thing. Unfortunately, to this day, the killer has never been identified for certain. Many possibilities were discussed early, but the prime suspect was, and still is, James William Lewis. There was an image captured from the surveillance footage at the Walgreens showing Paula Prince purchasing the tainted pills. In the background, there is a man lurking who is believed to be James William Lewis. However, due to poor image quality, it could not be determined beyond a shadow of a doubt. Shortly after the murders and the mass recall, Lewis sent letters attempting to extort Johnson & Johnson for $1 million, stating that he would, quote, stop the killing if they paid him the hefty sum. In December of 1982, he was tracked down and arrested in New York City, where he had moved earlier in the same month the killings began. Though there was insufficient evidence to convict him of the murders, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for extortion. He served 13 and was released in 1995. He maintained his innocence, even in interviews as recently as 2009. However, James Lewis even described in chilling detail to investigators how someone might be able to replace the medicine inside a Tylenol capsule with cyanide, even though he was insistent that he was only trying to help. None nearly as likely as Lewis, but there were other suspects for the crime. Roger Arnold was brought up as a potential suspect. He then shot and killed the person who he believed turned him into the police for the poisonings. The person he shot, however, turned out to be someone completely unrelated to the bartender he thought was responsible. Arnold was subsequently sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder. Another suspect was Lori Dan. Lori suffered from extreme mental illness and had a history of attempted poisonings, including unsuccessfully attempting to poison several people with overly diluted arsenic dosed into juice and snacks she prepared as gifts or samples. Years after the Tylenol murders, she would be responsible for a mass shooting at an elementary school where she murdered an eight-year-old student and injured four other children with gunfire. After fleeing, she took a man hostage in his own home before shooting him and then herself. She died as a result of her wounds, but fortunately, her hostage survived the attack. Years later, after his capture, it was pondered whether the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, a domestic terrorist native to Chicago, could have been responsible for the Tylenol murders. Kaczynski, however, maintained that he had never even possessed cyanide, and there was never a significant link between him and the murders. This heinous act elicited others to commit copycat crimes in attempts for selfish personal gain. For instance, in 1986, Stella Nickel of Seattle, Washington, filled Excedrin capsules with cyanide and used them to murder her husband, Bruce. After returning home from work complaining of a headache, Bruce took four tainted extra-strength Excedrin capsules and collapsed to the floor within minutes. She then left contaminated bottles at the store, which killed Susan Snow and non-fatally poisoned Snow's husband, all in an attempt to receive insurance money from her husband's death. Initially, Bruce's death was ruled to be from natural causes. However, as a parallel to the Chicago Tylenol murders, it was discovered to be cyanide when the assistant medical examiner identified the smell of bitter almonds during his autopsy. Stella was sentenced to 90 years in prison. In 1991, another copycat scenario occurred when Joseph Mayling, 
attempted to murder his wife by lacing Sudafed capsules with cyanide in a bid to benefit from her $700,000 life insurance policy. Just like Nichols' story, Mailing tampered with the medicine and allowed other people to take it to divert attention from his intentions. Unlike the previous story, however, two people died, but his wife survived. He persuaded his wife to take the pills to stop her from snoring. After she fell unconscious, he rushed her to the emergency room. In a confounding twist, his wife Jennifer likely only survived because Joseph asked the ER doctors if they considered the possibility that she had been poisoned with cyanide. Of course it became clear that Joseph was responsible for the deaths, as well as his wife's near death. Despite the situation, his wife testified in his defense, and a two-year-long court case proceeded. He was eventually found guilty of the crimes due to evidence gathered from wiretapping his phone conversations, where he demonstrated patterns of abuse toward his wife and her family. He was sentenced to life in prison. The Chicago Tylenol murders had far-reaching effects which impacted public perceptions and consumer protections. One of the most immediate effects was the heightened concern by parents for the children while trick-or-treating especially for the Halloween in 1982, which followed only a month after the murders. Parents became wary of allowing their children to accept candy from strangers, which prompted urges that still continue to this day for parents to inspect children's candy before it is eaten. As a direct result of this case, significant advancements rapidly took place for tamper-resistant packaging, Tylenol, like other over-the-counter medications at the time, used to be packaged on retail shelves in unsealed containers with only a cotton ball shoved down at the top, making them easy to access. Additionally, the capsules were originally made so that the medicinal powder inside was contained in a capsule that could be easily pulled apart and tampered with. Because of this, the pills moved to the compressed tablets we're more familiar with today. The tamper-evident seals and packaging methods evolved not only for Tylenol, but many other products as well, including packaging for food products. Moreover, laws went into effect which made product tampering a federal crime. In fact, the very product tampering laws that came from this horrific case were used to convict Stella Nickel in her case. The events that took place in Chicago in 1982 were simply abhorrent. The lives of seven people were unceremoniously extinguished at random without any consideration for their innate value as humans. Each of the victims left behind a story and a number of grieving loved ones who will undoubtedly bear their memories as well as the lifelong scar this case surely burdened them with. It's likely little consolation to those directly affected by this tragedy. But at very least, positive changes did come from the incredible responses to this case in the forms of federal product tampering laws and the vastly improved product packaging standards. Despite this, the case of the Chicago Tylenol murders still lingers unsolved. Of course, solving the case wouldn't bring back their loved ones, but as humans, we tend to struggle to cope without closure. We crave it to help us move on in life. In the words of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the bitterest tears shed over graves are for words left unsaid and deeds left undone. I hope you enjoyed this brief documentary on the Chicago Tylenol murders. If so, please like the video and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Until next time.